Hey folks, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. This is the afternoon session. I'm Michael Bryant. Brad Micklin is with me here in studio. Eklan Mercy to join us soon enough. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. I'm tired. You know, it's Friday afternoon. It's been a long week. Uh, I'm not going to let you off the hook so quickly, but we've had so many trials back to back, two at a time, three at a time, defendants testifying. You know, I'm gassed. So today we have the opportunity to look both forward and a little bit in the rearview mirror for some things coming up on the Law and Crime Network and some things that have just wrapped up that are still kind of uh, percolating in our brains. Okay, so let's open up the Durst uh, bag of tricks here. Uh, Brad Micklin with me on set here, trial attorney. So let's start with the first attack that the prosecution or that the defense has made on the prosecution's agency with this production company. I think it's a valiant effort but let's go through the analysis. What, what do you think the defense was trying to say and how did they fail? Well, the defense was trying to say that the production company was acting as if they were the prosecutor or acting for the state on behalf of the state. So anything that they obtained would be or would have to be obtained constitutionally. And if it's obtained by an individual, it could be obtained almost anyway. So they're trying to argue that because they obtained it at maybe the direction of the state. They should be treated like actors or members of the state, and therefore he gets the same kind of protection. And that kicks in Fourth Amendment protections, et cetera. Right. It failed, but you know, there, it's kind of a sliding scale of that participation. So what do you think the key ingredient is uh, that, that allowed the prosecution to basically cut ties with that production company as an agent? What, what, what would they really have needed to do to connect them as an agency? They would have to have specific direction. The prosecutor or a governmental agent of some sort would have to go and contact in some way the production company and say do this or do that or get me this. If there was that kind of direct um, instruction then they could tie it together as if they were acting as an agent of the government but I don't think they have that. They, they apparently did not convince the court of that. Okay let's go back into court and these this is a pretrial hearing again the trial coming up against Robert Durst in California is for the death of Susan Berman his best friend she was about to blab he felt according to the prosecution let's go back into court. So there we have a hearing from a few weeks ago in the case against Robert Durst again for the death of Susan Berman it is a murder case coming up in January Monday will be another pretrial hearing in this matter they've got all kinds of stuff to sort through and figure out and fight about and of course when the jury finally gets to hear it the theory is that everything is synthesized to what they really need to know and it makes the trial move along you know much more quickly that's the theory hey joining brad and i now gene rossi is with me i am so happy to have you good to see you buddy how are you uh it's a beautiful friday good afternoon it is let me ask you about this case robert durst uh we were talking about the attempt that the defense made to have the HBO production company declared an agent of the state. Therefore, Fourth Amendment issues should be kicking in. The judge said, uh, no. Interesting question I have for you. I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, we know that there was audio recordings as a result of that production that are very damning to Mr. Durst. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. But I think it's important for folks to know, in case, you know, they ever want to tape a loved one or a divorces in the brewing or a boyfriend girlfriend that in certain states you don't have to have the permission of the person you're taping so in New York where it is a first party state I can tape anybody I want because I'm the quote first party and as long as it's okay with me it's okay to do it which sounds so unfair but it's the way it is and if you can take advantage of a great as opposed to California or other states where you couldn't do that this was a production done I think primarily in California but it wasn't an issue there because it was part of the production clearly he had a mic on and he was being recorded but talk about the importance of that distinction with first party second party and surreptitious recordings like that well I can give you a famous case called the uh William Clinton impeachment process. I've heard and of Ken that. Stars yes. uh -huh. And uh, I think in Maryland, it's a two-party uh, state where both the uh, both parties have to consent to a recording. And Linda Tripp was making recordings from Maryland of, of course, uh, Monica Lewinsky. And an issue in that case was uh, she violated Maryland law. Is she going to get immunity? That goes to her credibility. And there was a lot of uh, issue about that. And also the agency issue came up in addition to the immunity issue. Was she acting at the behest of the federal prosecutors? And of course, the answer was no. She was a sole, a sole practitioner, if you will. And she made those recordings that she eventually turned over to the federal prosecutors. And just because a private citizen obtains evidence illegally, that can be handed over to the government on a silver platter if the government is not involved at all. 
Yeah, and I think we're going to see more and more of this as we move forward, Gene, because you have these podcasts, you have these these proactive type programs, true crime shows where, you know, companies are, are reinvestigating cases and then turning it over to cops. So that line may be getting more and more blurred. And I think this is not the last we're going to see of this, uh, this issue being litigated. So you might be wondering, as you see Robert Durst there kind of uh, meekly folded into the chair at the defense table, whether or not this is a death penalty case. It is California despite the moratorium on the death penalty. Put that aside for a second. Uh, they're not seeking the death penalty in this case. Brad Micklin, trial attorney here, is with me. And, you know, we just listened to the prosecution there, Mr. Lewin, laying out some of the details, uh, as he sees them, of the crime, of the murder. But hold on, we, we don't even get there. It's not like Durst admits that he was there, that he saw anybody, that he was involved. He, he just didn't do it. He had nothing to do with it. So at this point in the pretrial phase, what's the prosecution's uh, effort here? What are they doing? Well, they're trying to build a circumstantial case. And, and Durst has a stream of bodies in his past that he's seemed to walk away from. So I think they're trying very carefully to build very strong, very safe foundation to try to make this jury believe that he committed this crime. So Gene, you know, he prosecuted 100 plus cases as, as a federal prosecutor. What's your take when your defendant, the one you're going up against, the one you're trying to convict basically just says, I wasn't even there. You got the wrong guy. Is that easier or harder? Well, that's an alibi case. You know, the murder occurred in uh, Los Angeles and I was in Chicago. Uh, that's sort of a quasi uh, O.J. Simpson argument, I guess. But um, if I'm a prosecutor and they say they weren't at the scene of the crime, they were in another city, they were hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, you have made my day because there's always a witness. There's always a record. There's always something that places them at or near that crime, whether it's a cell tower record, you probably won't have it here, but that would make my day an alibi. Yeah, so, you know, and, and uh, as the, the defendant staunchly says, I didn't do it, kind of the Bart Simpson defense, I didn't do it, uh, sometimes it makes it easier for the prosecution because there's, there, there's not even a, a shred of any sort of responsibility taken by the defendant. So if the prosecution has the evidence, maybe uh, that steadfast, I didn't do it, doesn't pay off for the defense. Let's listen now to the judge. The judge in the pretrial phase, generally the same as the judge for the trial phase. Uh, and this is Judge Calra, and a decision made on some of these pretrial issues, really, if you think about it, it's a great primer for what's coming in this case. Listen to the thought process for the ruling. So let's kind of uh, weigh through what this judge has just decided. Gene, let me start with you. It sounds to me, just in the big picture, prosecution's getting what they want. All this stuff's coming in. These admissions, uh, where the defendant was at the time that Ms. Berman was killed, all of these inferences. What do you think? Oh, God, if I'm the prosecutor, I'm just going to sit there and not even take a note because every item that they want into evidence and the, and the analysis of each item is in their favor and uh this is a this is a sufficiency hearing basically that you know motion to dismiss the indictment plus exclude evidence i think it's a great victory for the prosecution yeah it sounds like it and you know we, we probably don't remember all of the bodies involved here remember one of the admissions that will come in is killed them all of course from the hbo special as he was muttering his way into the bathroom uh brad micklin we know that it was the the wife that we believe he killed in 82 which the victim in this case, the Berman case, had knowledge of. And then there's that one in Texas in between, the the <laughs> landlord or in Galveston that he, he pulled the, the Scandarito defense, I call it here. Everybody remembers, I'm sure, the Scandarito case where Junior <laughs> testified that, yeah, I cut my dad up in pieces and I threw chunks in the dumpster at the golf course, but I didn't kill him. Well, Durst basically said the same thing about this guy in Texas, so he was convicted of dismembering the body and dumping it. How much of that's coming in? What's this jury in this case going to learn? It's hard to say. There's so much that they're trying to admit. And the rules of evidence do allow a lot of these statements to come in, like we just heard, like these admissions. I'm not a big fan of it because when you take things like, you know, him mumbling, yeah, I killed them all, you know, that could be in so many different contexts. Could have been sarcastic. Yeah, because up, yeah, I killed them all. Or because I killed them all. And depending on how that's going to the jury is going to really impact how they view him. And it's, I don't know, I, I'm not a fan of it, even though the rules allow for it. Yeah, in California too, lots of latitude of what comes in in terms of prior crimes and prior bad acts. So uh, that's not a good thing for Durst, who will be standing trial in January for the death of Susan Berman. Let's take a break. More to talk about. This is the Law and Crime Network. Good to have you along.